to welcome you to the first of our Highlight Seminar Series sem um, seminars this, this, uh, this year. We have seven scheduled already, and there probably will be more uh, coming online. But um, again, I, I guess I should start by introducing myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Carter. I'm the, the founding director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment here. And um, we're really delighted to have our speaker here today. I'm not going to do the introduction. I'm going to hand it off to our inaugural um, assistant professor in the Anlinger Center, um, uh, Dan Steingart. Um, who will who will introduce um, our speaker? But I just wanted to to advertise our next, as, as has been my tradition, our next seminar will be on October 14th, and it will be given by Marcus Pauly uh, from UC Berkeley, and he will talk about plant biotechnology for biofuels. Um, and the talk today uh, will will may tell us whether or not uh, that that talk will. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> lead us to be depressed or happy, I'm not sure which. Anyway, Dan, please uh, introduce our speaker. Hi, so it's, it's, it's a real honor to um, introduce Dr. Jerry Schnoor. I don't, I don't think he needs much of an introduction as uh, I understand that Princeton has been using his textbook on, on water and water policy for, for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Schnoor is, a, a, among many other things, a, a member of the National Academy of Engineering um, uh, he was elected for his pioneering work using mathematical models in science policy decisions, something that is related to but, but not directly in, 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 in what we're going to be hearing about today. So it really speaks to, to uh, the, the breadth of, of his interests. He's also the editor-in-chief of Environmental Science and Technology, um, one of the leading journals in both environmental engineering and environmental science. Um, I recently learned that Dr. Schnoor had run the um, 2010 Clark Prize, and and uh, it comes with a cash award. And he decided to pay the award forward to the uh, uh, Iowa State chapter of Engineers for a Sustainable World, where he's been teaching since 1977. I thought that was really uh, an absolutely lovely thing to do. Um, as a recognition of, of the fact that these students are going to be the ones implementing this change. Uh, so before I um, um, give the floor to Dr. Schnoor, I want to make sure that everyone turns off their cell phones because uh, these lectures are recorded. And just remember that these lectures are being recorded during the question and answer period. So without further ado, Dr. Schnoor, thank you. Thanks very much, Dan, for that kind introduction, and to Emily and uh, Peter Jaffe and others for inviting me here to the Anlinger uh, Center. It's a, the first time with the new center that I've been here, and it's been many years uh, since I've been uh, at Princeton, but I have so many uh, friends here in summer, which uh, some of whom are in the audience, so it's really nice to be back. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, biofuels. I have some... Um, I had the good fortune, actually, to be involved with National Research Council uh, committees related to this topic, I would say. Uh, let's see. How do we advance? There we go. And uh, the, the, the re these reports, I draw some of the information for this talk from these reports. Uh, this particular one I chaired on water implications of biofuels production in the U.S. and a more recent one on renewable fuel standard U.S. biofuel uh, policy. So uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I learned. I learned an awful lot from uh, serving on these committees and uh, listening to the interdisciplinary uh, groups of uh, scientists and engineers and policymakers, much like the Anlinger Center is uh, all about. We will talk about uh, the policy setting, how we came to be interested in biofuels, uh, the impacts associated on water with growing the crops, with producing the biofuel at uh, biofuel production facilities, and just I'll touch a little bit on some sustainability issues in, in addition to water, including greenhouse uh, gases and uh, energy budget and so forth.
the Energy Security and Independence Act, so-called uh, ISA 2007, was passed by Congress uh, mainly for energy security. It was about uh, worrying about uh, the use of imported oil for our transportation fuels prim primarily, and that's what led them to say, well, maybe biofuels is an answer for that. At the same time, I was uh, speaking with uh, several people today, including Rob Sokolow, and uh, in 2007, you may or may not remember that the entire country thought we were going to have comprehensive climate change legislation. So, uh, and, and that policy changed, actually that thinking changed very quickly from 2007 to 2009 for uh, various reasons. But uh, they were really interested, in addition, in greenhouse gases. So they put some greenhouse gas requirements on these biofuels and some subsidies associated with it too. So that uh, the, nation, the notion is if the United States is going to pay uh, to um, have these biofuels and subsidize them, we should get some improved performance out of it in addition to energy security. And that improved performance could be uh, better uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. The renewable fuel standard goes year by year, and every year EPA has to uh, uh, evaluate it. But this is sort of how it was set up from the 2007 Act. There was an earlier uh, provision before this, but it shows that so-called conventional biofuels, mostly corn ethanol, were, uh, were um, supposed to grow this way, and they essentially have peaked uh, now at nearly the um, uh, rate that EPA said was mandated. But uh, some of the others haven't been quite as fortunate. Biomass uh, diesel, this is uh, uh, using any kind of a biomass to produce a, a biodiesel uh, product, has also grown approximately in this relation. But the advanced biofuels, these three are considered advanced biofuels, both the unspecific advanced biofuels, we'll talk more about that, and in particular, the cellulosic biofuels have not mm, come to fruition. They're not progressing at the rate that Congress and EPA, uh, in their wisdom in setting up this mandated schedule, uh, thought that they would. So at first, in beginning, I think it was in 2010, uh, EPA had to, on an annual basis, begin backing off of the cellulosic uh, biofuel uh, requirement to make ethanol. So this would be ethanol made from corn stover or switchgrass or wood residues or energy crops uh, like switchgrass. And uh, the simple fact is that we still don't have any, really not a drop of what you'd call commercial scale cellulosic biofuels being produced in this country. There, there's several demonstrations and we'll talk about some of those. And there are some plants, about 10 or 12 plants that are supposedly in the throes of being built. But the cellulosic biofuel uh, has been very slow uh, to develop. So probably that's in jeopardy. Where's my pointer at? And uh, in addition, all of these, you'd have to say, are pretty much no-goes in the sense that to have uh, cellulosic biofuels of this magnitude three and even 16 billion gallons, you'd have to have the plants built now in order to have it done by uh, 2022 and be producing that much uh, biofuel at scale. So quite frankly, it's not going to happen. And e either Congress is going to somehow have to, gonna have to back off of this schedule or EPA is going to have to revise it year by year, one or the other uh, things. And, you could ask, in fact, uh, in my conversations today here in the center, uh, I was asked, uh, is this due to a technological problem, the, the technology isn't developing, or is it just purely an economical one? And I'd say that's two sides of the same coin, really. Uh, we can't produce the uh, cellulosic biofuels commercially at a price uh, which is acceptable right now. And uh, so the, I... I uh, mentioned to Eric Larson that even the enzymes are still costing 50 cents to even a dollar a gallon to uh, enzymatically hydrolyze and ferment uh, cellulose uh, into uh, ethanol. 
and we're trying to produce the ethanol for roughly a dollar and a half a gallon, something like that. So uh, we're just way far off in terms of really having uh, commercial cellulosic uh, biofuels so far. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why. I'll start uh, with biodiesel. And um, biodiesel, as you know, is a transesterification uh, process. And we can get the oil for the triglycerides from various, and we are getting it actually, from various processes. Now we've got more than one billion gallons of uh, this being produced. A uh, good proportion of it is coming from uh, waste uh, cooking oils, um, several tens of percents. And, but most of it is coming from uh, soybean. In Canada, more from canola and some refineries, uh, biodiesel processing facilities in the United States also are using a little bit of canola and some animal fats. But uh, together with in the reaction with methanol and catalyst, you produce a, this mixture of methyl uh, fatty acid esters, and uh, these uh, are the mixture which is known as biodiesel. And you get a, quite a lot of glycerin out of the process too, in fact so much that it's kind of created a glut on the price of glycerin which sells for uh, uh, glycerol, which sells glycerin which sells for as low as even a penny, a one cent to eight cents a, a pound, something like that. But biodiesel has some limitations though, even though uh, it's doing rather well at the moment. The main reason that it's doing rather well is that it's got a, a nice tax credit incentive and more about that in a minute. And, uh, but the main problem with biodiesel, uh, say from soybeans, is the cost. The profit margin is really very, very marginal on biodiesel as compared to, uh, say, corn ethanol when uh, things are going well is really quite profitable and maybe even profitable without a uh, subsidy or, or tax credit. And then there is this issue of what to do with all the uh, glycerol byproduct as well. So it, it happened about a uh, little more than a year ago, right about here. This had been the US monthly production of biodiesel, which had kind of gone up and down even under the uh, renewable fuel standard mandate. But uh, along about here, Congress reinstituted a tax credit of about a dollar and one cent per gallon uh, on blending uh, for biodiesel uh, into petroleum uh, diesel. And it, boom, the production just took off again. And so now we're at around 1.1 or even 1.4 billion gallons. And uh, biofuel also enjoys something kind of unique when EPA made the greenhouse gas requirements that we mentioned earlier, uh, I, didn't, I wouldn't have supposed that uh, biodiesel would qualify for, as an advanced biofuel. But because its uh, greenhouse gas performance is good relative to uh, petrol diesel, uh, because of that, it does now qualify as an advanced biofuel. So it fulfills two of the categories of the EPA uh, mandate, both the biomass biodiesel, it counts as that, and it counts as an advanced unspecified uh, biofuel. So the prospects for biodiesel are relatively good right now, and it's, and it's growing. Uh, it also enjoys the advantage, as you know, of being a so-called drop-in fuel. It can be mixed directly with petrol uh, diesel or even replace petrol diesel uh, in uh, engines and infrastructure. And that has a lot of advantages compared to ethanol, which uh, requires a kind of unique uh, infrastructure. Right now it's being hauled around in railroad cars and uh, tanker uh, trucks. There's uh, only one pipeline in the country that's corrosion proof and hygroscopic uh, proof enough to transport ethanol. So ethanol has a lot of mm, limitations associated with it compared to, say, uh, biodiesel. Also, as you know, in Europe and other countries, biodiesel is still uh, very popular and the emission controls, the filters are, are relatively efficient from a health uh, standpoint and now we're adopting that technology here in the, so I'd say the prospects for biodiesel are relatively uh, rosy in the future. And there's over 100 plants and they're all over the United States, as you can see, uh, again using uh, number one, soybean oil, but also waste uh, cooking oils and, 
animal fats and uh, whatever people can uh, economically get their hands on uh, at all these various uh, facilities. And it enjoys the dollar a gallon uh, tax credit, which is really a good thing. Now, soybeans, which are the main oil uh, feedstock for uh, uh, biodiesel production, uh, grew, for, uh, uh, grew in acreage and yield. The red line is yield. The green bars are acreage uh, over the last few decades. But it's kind of actually, the planted acres has kind of leveled off recently. I'll show you, I think, uh, in the next slide. And um, here you can see that uh, really the growth in acreage planted has been in corn. In fact, we're at a record level in 2013 of about 97 million acres planted for corn. And biofuel, uh, uh, bio uh, corn ethanol, is using about 40% of that, almost 40% of the corn crop. So we're talking about a lot of land. Uh, just before we came in, we looked up New Jersey is uh, a little more than 5 million acres, and we're using 40 million acres for uh, corn ethanol production alone. So like eight New Jerseys, if, if I did the math right, something like that. Uh, that's a lot of land uh, dedicated. And what did we get for all that land? Uh, well, we got... Um, uh, you know, we got 10% of the transportation fuel replaced. That was Congress's eventual goal was like about 25% of the transportation fuel to be replaced with biofuel. So we're not quite halfway uh, to the goal, but it took 40% of our corn to get us 10% of our uh, biofuel uh, by a volume per volume reduction in uh, transportation fuel. And uh, I don't know how you think of that as a trade-off, but it kind of shows that photosynthesis is really a dilute energy source, and you need an awful lot of land in order to uh, make a starch crop for an energy fuel like ethanol. Oh, I should mention one thing, because uh, this comes up a lot. Uh, total, uh, the, the question is, are, are, is this corn being planted on marginal land or uh, really bad uh, land? And, in general, the answer is uh, no. The total um, acreage for agriculture in the United States has been roughly constant for decades. So mostly it's replacing other grains and other crops, cotton, sorghum, uh, oats, uh, uh, alfalfa. It's replacing those acreages, and that's where we're getting the corn acreage from. But uh, in our report, we also showed that there has been a decline in enrollment in the Conservation Reserve Program for marginal lands uh, in the nation. In Iowa alone, we've lost more than a million acres from the Conservation Reserve Program. So some marginal land is being replaced uh, to uh, give us this boost in uh, corn acreage. Worldwide, uh, I, again, I think the prospects maybe for biodiesel are a bit better than uh, corn ethanol. You can see that it's uh, on a worldwide basis, it's bigger than ethanol in terms of millions of liters uh, produced, but, but both of them are growing still fast. It's not only the United States that wanted, quote, energy security. You know, the whole world kind of got on this bandwagon at once. Now, uh, from a policy perspective, Europe is sort of backing off, is in the throes of kind of backing off it. I think they had a 6% goal. We're at 10% now uh, of replacement of the transportation fuel. And now I think it's down to 3.75% or something like that, if I recall, in the last reading. So Europe's sort of backing off. We, we haven't in uh, this country. Uh, I'd like to move for a moment to uh, corn ethanol now, and that's producing the great abundance, uh, 13 or 14 billion gallons per year uh, in this country. And it comes from a starch crop, so from starch you can't make biodiesel. Rather from starch, you know, you, you make uh, mixed alcohols, or in this case, ethanol. And uh, that's what is supplying most of our uh, biofuels right now. Now, f corn is a pretty... Uh, cool crop in the sense that you can get an awful lot of good things out of it. You can go an awful lot of different ways. Uh, a bushel, I don't know if we have bushel baskets anymore. When I was a kid, that was something. And it, uh, it contains about 50 pounds, uh, maybe a little more than that, 
54 pounds of uh, corn kernels uh, from the corn uh, plant. And you can do a lot of things with that. You could make uh, about 31 pounds of starch for food, because it's a, st a starch crop, like potatoes or whatever. Uh, you could instead make 33 pounds of corn sweetener, uh, and Michael Pollan wouldn't like that <laughs> if you did, uh, but uh, you could make corn uh, sweetener out of it. We sweeten an awful lot of foods, and we do use it for some of that. And, uh, or you could turn it into ethanol, and you get about 2.8 gallons from that bushel to give you some physical idea. But you do get some nice byproducts, too, which we should mention. It's probably the only time I'll mention it here. And that is you can get um, so-called dry distiller grains consisting of a gluten feed that we can give to the animals uh, and gluten meal and uh, corn oil. So all mixed up. This could replace, you could say, as much as a third of the fee feed value of the corn that was used. So if you look at it in that way, you're only using two-thirds of those acres to replace animal feed because one-third are coming back. Do you see what I mean? Uh, in the form of these dry distiller grains. And in Iowa, we're the number one leader of this, and uh, you create about 40 permanent jobs for an average size facility of about 50 million gallons per day. And they're good, they're good jobs. They're good, high-paying uh, jobs. As you know, uh, ethanol is now on its own uh, because, in, uh, rightfully so, I think Congress did say in their, in their wisdom, as of January 1st, 2012, we're going to end the subsidy on corn ethanol because it's a, it's a proven commodity now. We're going to stop that subsidy. So we have. So whatever production is going on now presumably is uh, profitable even without the, at the end, of, it was a 45 cent a gallon blender's uh, fee. It had been more than that uh, in the early years. So ethanol seems like it's profitable even without the tax credit incentive. And it's going forward. And at the moment, it's almost filled out the mandate for uh, what I showed you in the RFS2. But we're using, as I mentioned, an awful lot. I have to keep changing these numbers on the pie diagram. I apologize. I got the original slide from a colleague at NSF. But uh, last year, ethanol passed up animal feed as the largest use of corn. So now uh, ethanol is more than animal feed. It's knocked exports quite a bit down also. And uh, yeah, it's even affected competition for food uh, and uh, hand corn and corn sweeteners. Again, Michael Pollan might like that. We're growing an awful lot of corn now. There's an incentive, 97 million acres uh, planted uh, this year. And of course, it can be used for a lot of different things. Well, you can imagine that a brand new market like this that has emerged in a relatively short period of time, a few years, uh, creates um, a demand for corn, and that that will support the price. And the, uh, of course, the Ag uh, Congress people have always been much in favor of this, probably not so much even as for energy security, but as some kind of a uh, basement a pr uh, price boost for their commodity crop. And it has served that way. These are uh, very high uh, prices that they've enjoyed uh, in recent years. And even though uh, stockpiles are pretty good right now, and it looks like this year's crop might be uh, pretty good, that's caused the price very recently to uh, go down again. Now, that's actually good for corn ethanol producers, because now their feedstock is reasonably priced again. Uh, but I, I might remind you that all of this, uh, uh, I have another talk, uh, uh, time permitting, we could go on uh, climate change. And of course, that affects a, a lot of policy. And last year, we had a severe uh, drought uh, in the United States, and Iowa in particular. And uh, this year, we're still about more than a third of the nation is in drought. You may recall the recent uh, storms in uh, Colorado. Uh, may have helped this severe drought area right here, and may have even helped Iowa is still in drought. We had floods this spring, and now we're in drought, if you can imagine. We're just seesawing between uh, flood and drought at great, at great expense and consternation. When you have a drought like we had last year, 
it's a little bit like a cartel. You know, the climate becomes your uh, enemy and can affect the uh, corn prices and also the profitability of your transportation fuel, namely uh, corn ethanol. And uh, so we had a big drop in uh, yields last year. And you're subject to this kind of variability uh, if you decide to go with a, a commodity crop for uh, transportation fuel. Well, what about the water? If you think about the hydrologic cycle, all of this corn, 100 million acres of corn, has to uh, use a lot of water, and it, and it does. And the water can come from uh, surface water irrigation, or it could come from groundwater irrigation. Most of the time, it's this, groundwater irrigation. Or it could be so-called green water. It could be rain-fed agriculture, where there's an, you know, plenty of rain that falls, and so the plant just takes it up from the uh, soil moisture. And uh, some of my colleagues would argue, well, it's all water, and it doesn't matter whether it takes it up from the soil or whether it takes it up from the groundwater aquifer. But there are some very practical um, limitations associated with the so-called blue water and using uh, aquifer water, for example, to uh, irrigate the corn. So if you live in uh, uh, Nebraska or Colorado or Kansas or uh, the Oklahoma, Texas Delta, uh, they've gone whole hog for uh, corn ethanol too. Most of the plants were built when there was still a, a tax credit. And that was a big incentive. And the states even gave more tax credit to a big incentive to build these facilities. And in 2007, 2008, they were going up. They were paying for themselves in like a six-month uh, payback period. So multi-million dollar facilities going up virtually overnight. It was like a gold rush. But uh, you can imagine that uh, they've got to irrigate in this part of the country. Uh, they've got to irrigate that uh, corn for corn ethanol. And it comes, it's more than 2,000 gallons per bushel. So if you get 2.8 bushels uh, of ethanol per gallon, you can figure out that it's almost 1,000 gallons of water required just in irrigation water to produce a gallon of ethanol. So it's really a big water user, one of the biggest, especially if you're irrigating. And the blue dots are the ethanol production facilities. Now, the black dots are ethanol production facilities here, but I use this slide to remind you that it's, uh, this is the Ogallala Aquifer. So essentially, uh, in Nebraska, they're using uh, aquifer water. This is our big natural resource. It's equal in volume about to Lake Huron. But uh, if you can imagine, a largely a surficial, unconfined aquifer equal to Lake Huron. And we're, uh, in the beginning, we were given a big tax credit to pump this down unsustainably uh, at much larger than the, ever the recharge rates and use it to produce a transportation uh, fuel. So I would say that's not sustainable in the long run if for no other reason you're using up your aquifer, which, which we are. Now, but even in the so-called rain-fed uh, corn belt area like Iowa, where I'm from right here, these ethanol production facilities also have uh, an issue. They don't irrigate the corn for the most part, but they do require a lot of pure groundwater for the ethanol production facility. So it's not a regional whole aquifer problem like the earlier discussion, but rather it's more a local uh, township or a rural problem with pumping down the aquifers in order to supply the water for the production facility. And now they're, they're getting more efficient at this, but it still is a big problem. These are largely confined aquifers, occasionally uh, unconfined, surficial, but usually confined aquifers. And we are pumping down our groundwater very unsustainably in the Midwest. The uh, Cambrian Ordovician Aquifer, I, I didn't put in the slide here, but we've pumped it down around Chicago about 800 feet. And so it's totally unsustainable that you, know, you can continue uh, to do this uh, in the future. And it's not just the United States. Again, the pumping down aquifers, it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's in Pakistan, it's in India, it's in Europe, it's all, it's all over. Uh, China as well. Can I ask you something? Yes. Do aquifers have a means of being replenished? They do recharge, but the, more on the order of centuries to even uh, millennia. 
So we're, you know, we're doing it in the, in, on the years, in a few years. Uh, this is the process diagram. I won't go into the whole thing, but how we make uh, corn ethanol. Just suffice it to say you need high purity water, so usually this is a reverse osmosis product, uh, process. So you, you don't want to start with surficial waters, which are dirty, and have all the soil eroded from the corn that you're growing <laughs> for the ethanol. Rather, you'd take uh, groundwater and uh, then put it through reverse osmosis for high purity water, and then you hydrolyze it, and you add enzymes in order to, uh, uh, so first you uh, get the starch into sugars and then you ferment the uh, starch. And these process here is taking up way too much uh, technology and dollar uh, in terms of producing ethanol uh, in a sustainable way. Here's the dry distiller grains uh, right here after the distillation uh, system. And there's issues with Volatile organic carbons, air there's air pollution issues, and there's water pollution issues associated with this reject water from the uh, reverse osmosis product, too. I thought I'd show you one. In fact, one of, one of my colleagues from NJIT came to, I promised I'd show some real Iowa corn and some real Iowa production facilities. And this is one uh, kind of in the center of the state, Lincoln Way Energy. It's a typical plant. It's 50 million gallons per year. Uh, ethanol, it uses 18 million bushels of corn. Mm, that's uh, in a normal year, that's more than 100,000 acres to give you some idea. So it's taking all the corn from all around it, 100,000 acres or, or more, and processing in this facility. So much so that about three quarters of our Iowa corn is being used up now. We're in danger of becoming a corn importing state to feed our animals because of. Uh, so much uh, corn ethanol. Uh, and uh, I should mention the number. So for the production facility, it's not as awesome of a number as the irrigation, but it's still big. It's about three gallons of water per gallon of ethanol produced. And that's, again, coming from a local aquifer and serving to pump that down. Uh, if you're in Kansas and you're irrigating, or uh, in this case, Nebraska, and you're irrigating that corn, uh, it's about 100 billion gallons. So uh, the operation would be equivalent to a city of about 2 million people. So for every one of those black dots I showed you on the other previous map, that's like a new town of 2 million people, another new town of 2 million people, 2 million in terms of the irrigated water use, which is just huge. And then for the production facility itself, it's a, again, it's about 100 million gallons per year, and that would be about three to 400 million gallons of water for a town, say, the size of Ogallala, Nebraska. In terms of water quality, the problem is, oh, I'm glad it wasn't my phone because I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> um, in terms of water quality, uh, uh, corn is the highest input grain, as you, as you know. And so we use more fertilizers, a lot more phosphorus and nitrogen than any other feedstock crop. We use more pesticides than any other feedstock crop. So that's part of the problem is planting more corn to grow this uh, biofuel just uses so many inputs. And if it rains after you put them on, and, and it often does, usually does, then uh, you're going to lose it. And that's, that's the issue. Now, soybeans are uh, less than half as bad, so again, biodiesel looks a little more attractive on a life cycle perspective than corn ethanol. But of course, if you do kind of the clever things like is going on at the uh, Princeton uh, Environmental Institute, uh, if, you combine, if you use the uh, water to um, make biomass for electricity, or if you even want to make cellulosic ethanol, it, it's going to, it should perform theoretically much better from this standpoint, or even if you're going to uh, produce syngas from the biomass also, you'd still need lots fewer inputs, at least according to this particular uh, paper. There's another water quality issue that you can imagine. It doesn't all run off the land. Some of it seeps into the groundwater. And so if you're in an area like uh, eastern uh, Nebraska or western Iowa or southern Wisconsin, uh, we have very high concentrations of nitrate 
in the groundwater as a result of applying so much nitrogen fertilizer uh, to the uh, corn uh, crop. So groundwater is a sustainability issue, the quality of it in addition to the quantity of it that we talked about earlier. One of the things that we're doing, I, I maybe don't have enough time to sh show you uh, all of our research, but we're running models at uh, the basin uh, scale and even smaller to try to figure out, we're using agent-based models, so we, uh, uh, Sylvia Secchi, our economist, surveys the farmers. We try to understand how they think and why they do what they do, what do they plant, how do they plant it, how do they till it, uh, what fertilizers do they put on and why, and then we try to put all that into an agent-based model, and we combine that with a, a basically a water quality model, uh, quantity and quality, to figure out under different scenarios or policies what would be the uh, water implications as a result of those. And uh, so again, yeah, we're interested at the uh, more regional to local scale, exactly how much runs off. These nitrogen yields are about 20% of the uh, addition. So that's a huge loss. In 2008, when we had the floods, uh, my student calculated that Iowa farmers alone lost over a billion dollars uh, in fertilizers uh, to the flood. Yes? Does the corn yield scale with the fertilizer? Uh, yes and no. The areas of dark brown here usually are the most fertile areas, so they do have the highest yield in general. And the farmers think they understand, you know, how much they have to put on. But you can imagine there has to be a safety factor to account for that which is going to run off. And you, you never know exactly how much that's going to be. So it's a bit of a buying an insurance policy to put on somewhat more than the crop actually needs. Uh, phosphorus yield, it's more like um, uh, 1 to 5 percent of the phosphorus runs off. It holds to the uh, soil grain better but still a lot of runoff from uh, phosphorus as well. And it's not just a problem with ruining the water quality in the area where the biofuel crop feedstock is being grown, like Iowa, but of course it's all the way down the Mississippi and uh, to the uh, Gulf of Mexico and the uh, Gulf hypoxia problem also. So it's not only us, it's downstream people that we're affecting too. And there, uh, the Louisiana shrimp fishermen are mad as hell at the Iowa farmers, as you can imagine, uh, because they feel like their livelihood is being threatened. Uh, in, uh, we had an NSF grant uh, in the 2008 flood. This is my student, Aaron Gwinnup, and we followed the flood waters with all the ag runoff in it all the way down from the uh, from Iowa all the way down the Mississippi and then out into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And this is just a view of, I don't know if you can see it, but these are the uh, uh, more gray Gulf waters and this is the Mississippi coming out, the dirtier, I I'm not sure you can make it out in this image. But uh, then we sampled uh, with Nancy Rabelais' uh, help uh, the entire transport of the, uh, and it, what it did is it exacerbated and nutrient load by more than 30% and the hypoxia uh, by about 30% also according to our modeling effort. And uh, it was about 20,000 square kilometers that particular year. And you can see that the low oxygen, uh, the, the shrimp can mainly swim out of this, but you do lose it in terms of a shrimp uh, a nursery place and everything that can't swim out pretty much dies, and that's why they call it the so-called dead zone. Uh, I promise I'd talk a little bit about not just water, but a little bit about energy and uh, greenhouse gases. So when Congress decided they wanted to do energy security, this is sort of how they were looking at, and from a life cycle process, how EPA looks at the process. So you have to do it from... Uh, uh, from the beginning, from the cradle. And uh, so you're interested in how many passes does the farmer go through the field in a diesel uh, tractor and whether that diesel is imported fuel and some fraction of it would be uh, imported fuel. 
and you're interested in how much natural gas it took to uh, make the fertilizers for the corn and also to dry the corn at the end of this, and whether that came from domestic gas. Now with, sh with shale gas, there's a lot more now coming from uh, domestic, but you're interested in that question. You're interested in the inputs of running the production facility. Where are you getting the power to run that? They take a lot of power. And for the most part, we're using natural gas and coal uh, to run those uh, systems. So the coal is domestic. The National Security Advisor would like that. And the natural gas uh, may or may not be uh, uh, domestic. So if you look just strictly from our viewpoint as uh, energy and environmental people, normally we would calculate the uh, efficiency ratio as the motor fuel energy out, so the transportation energy out in the ethanol, divided by how many fossil fuels did we have to put in total to produce it, including all of these things. And uh, the numbers vary all over the place. But if you look at uh, my own journal, ESNT, and we looked at 24 different papers, I think, the average is something like about 1.3. So it has an EROI, an energy return on energy investment, of only 30%. That, that's not very good. Uh, and really, you shouldn't run your economy on something with a, only getting 30% more energy out than you're putting in. But of course, some people would say, well, see, it's a renewable fuel. We're getting out more. The sunlight energy is giving us more energy out uh, than we're uh, putting in. But if you're the National Security Advisor, you don't look at it like this. You don't look, worry about so much the fossil energy in as the imported fossil energy in. And especially with shale uh, gas and so forth, this number continues to go down, down, down. So many members of so the, from an energy security standpoint, we're achieving our goal. And this number might be as high as 10 uh, because of so few um, imported uh, energy inputs. Yes, Dan. There, it is improving. It's continuously improving. And the water numbers of three gallons per gallon, that's improving too. They're trying to recycle their water. And they are making improvements. But I would say, you know, when you're starting from 1.3, you get so far to go. Gasoline is something, if I remember right, you probably know it, six or eight, something like that. You know, this is a really horrible uh, energy return on, on energy invested. And from a water standpoint, it's the very worst one too. I have a slide, I didn't put it in here, but it's from Chesapeake Energy. And biofuels, what I'm showing you, is the absolute worst in ten terms of the energy water uh, nexus. So the energy, I'm sorry, the water to energy nexus, though, water in gallons per million BTUs of uh, transportation fuel energy produced is the absolute worst for uh, biofuels. Tar sands are much better, uh, and of course, uh, uh, fracking uh, uh, shale gas is much, much better. According to Chesapeake Energy, shale gas is positively good in terms of the, of the energy requirements. I'll let you decide about that. Well, and I thought we should mention at least about the greenhouse gas implications. I didn't have time to go into too much of that since the talk is mostly about water. But you know, there's some very famous uh, papers and, and uh, um, and, and follow-up papers to these as well, which question the use of corn uh, to make a transportation fuel because uh, we put on so much nitrogen, maybe an average of 160 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre. And according to all the EPA and, and uh, IPCC uh, workbook tables, you should assume that about 1.25% of that which you apply comes off as N2O gas, 1.25%. But many of the studies, as you may know, have shown much higher uh, emission rates of N2O, in fact, as high as 4 or even uh, 5%. And that changes the whole picture. It would change all of EPA's life cycle uh, calculations on whether these fuels are qualifying as better fuels under the original EISA law. So there's there's questions about the numbers, as you can, well, shouldn't be anything surprising, but uh, we're still arguing about these life cycle uh, assessment uh, numbers. 
not to mention the indirect land use also, the indirect land use of where is the land coming from, and even the direct land use. Are we using CRP land to plant this new uh, corn? So for all those reasons, the greenhouse gas effectiveness of the, of the RFS2 is at least controversial. Conservation Reserve Program. That's the payments to farmers to try to keep marginal lands out of production. But I mentioned we're bringing some back in now as a result of these big prices that people are getting. So cellulosic ethanol then is the future. It promises to be a lot better in terms of uh, inputs, the fertilizers, the pesticides. Uh, it should be irrigated less, so it should be better than that. Uh, it takes more water to process it so far. So that's a negative, but in general, the cellulosic biofuels, biofuels would still hold out promise uh, for the future, and we could fill out the schedule as Congress and EPA intended. There's two main processes, as you know, a biological uh, fermentation process, and for that, you need pretty pure feedstock. So it could be corn stover, or maybe a pure switchgrass or miscanthus, or maybe a willow uh, plantation, but those might work for a fermentation. There's also plants being uh, constructed supposedly, non-commercial yet, but you know using a thermochemical uh, method of basically gasification and, and catalysis to produce a mixture of alcohols or, or even uh, butanol or whatever. And these could be mixed and I understand that Eric Larson is about to study even the prairie. Uh, we'd love to replant our prairies. We've cleared 99% of our prairies in the Midwest, it would be wonderful to be able to put some back. And thermochemical methods could use a mixed uh, feedstock and maybe that would be a possibility for the future. But right now, the plants, we have two being built cellulosic ethanol plants in Iowa right now. And uh, the uh, one that I'm most familiar with is trying to use corn cobs and corn stover. This is how we uh, bale it up and haul it to the facility. There's lots of problems associated with it. You know, uh, uh, the cost of handling it, storing it, uh, it degrades through time. You only get it once per year, but you need feedstock all through the year. Uh, the trucks, the transportation required rurally to get it to town, all of these are big problems. This is the Poet. Uh, it's a Dutch company, DSM Advanced Biofuels, and they're working on side-by-side -side with a corn ethanol plant. They've got a cellulosic ethanol plant to use corn stover. And it's supposed to open in 2014, but you know, the old joke is, you know, biofuels are, uh, cellulosic biofuels are uh, five years into the future. They always have been and they always will be. And uh, that's sort of how it's played out so far. Switchgrass uh, or mixed prairie grasses would be wonderful if we could use that to make our transportation fuel. And it might have lower, um, uh, it might have lower impacts, environmental impacts, than what we've been talking about. Very recently, DOE twice has issued reports on whether we have enough bio, the so-called billion, uh, billion ton study, whether we have enough biomass to uh, do RFS2 or, or other policies. And the answer looks like we, we do have enough land and we do have the ability to produce enough uh, biomass. Uh, this is some of the places that uh, they think it will be uh, produced uh, either as an energy crop or corn stover or uh, wood residues. The switchgrass uh, in their report would indicate that that part of the industry would probably move south where there's plentiful water and rainfall. The forest would probably move south and east from the black dots that I showed you where there's plentiful forest residues. and. Uh, the building industry would love to see uh, this uh, develop. In the second report that I showed you at the outset, uh, the thing that it was a 50-50 mixture of environmental scientists, engineers, and economists. And the thing that was most compelling for the economists who sat on that NRC panel with me was this slide, and let me walk you through it. And that is that we did a survey, our, our little committee did a pretty comprehensive survey on willingness to pay. And uh, these are the various forms of uh, cellulose for uh, future cellulosic ethanol. And we asked the farmers uh, what, uh, 
first of all, we asked the uh, uh, farmers what they needed to grow this uh, from the production facility. And these are the numbers per, ton, per dry ton that they said they needed. And then we asked the ethanol producers, Valero and all the other ones, we asked them, how much would you pay to get this to make, how much could you pay? And this is what they said. So there's a huge price gap. This again shows the two sides of the same coin, the technology or the uh, huge price gap between the two. And this is why nothing is going anywhere. And uh, what convinces the economists that we're going to have to revise the uh, schedule because we're off by a about a dollar a gallon in terms of making it uh, economical. And that's where it stands at the moment, though there are a few plants uh, being built, not enough to fill out the schedule, uh, nothing, uh, no commercial uh, yet. This is where we stand. Mostly we filled out the mandate with corn ethanol. Iowa is the leader. I've gotten in a lot of trouble in the state for the things I've told you here today. There's people who would like to see me fired. And, uh, but so far I'm holding up. Thank God for tenure and academic freedom. Right? <laughs> and uh, uh, we're also supposed to, uh, in corn stover, produce another 1.7 billion gallons per year uh, from corn stover. We're already using a large fraction of our corn crop. The water, we're pumping down our aquifers, as I showed you. There's all kinds of other, we didn't have time to talk about, all kinds of other issues associated with uh, biofuels in the future, including food as a crop, including the greenhouse gases and the blend wall, which we're currently at. We've replaced 10% of our uh, transportation fuel with biofuels now. We're at a blend, a blend wall problem. And uh, I think the RFS2 will have to be modified. So in summary, biofuels, in the, they face enormous challenges. Cellulosic biofuels in particular isn't coming along as Congress had hoped. Uh, we're using an awful lot of groundwater and other waters uh, to produce these biofuels. And there is the problem of groundwater drawdown. If you were to say, uh, if you have a flex fuel vehicle, and you pull up today to the pump and you put in 10 gallons of uh, ethanol uh, E85 into your flex fuel vehicle, uh, I would tell you that that's like, uh, if it's non-irrigated, that's about 30 gallons of water. If it's irrigated, it could be 3,000 gallons of water equivalent. Uh, it's equivalent to, uh, Penny weighs about three grams, I think, if I remember right. So it's equivalent to throwing about three pennies worth of uh, uh, pure uh, ammonia nitrogen down the Mississippi River for every gallon that you put into your flex fuel vehicle. It's equal to about 20 to 40 pounds of soil eroded off the land. We didn't even talk about that uh, from, the from this additional production of the corn to fill the mandate. Yeah, and about three gallons per gallon of water. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jerry, you talked about the water and energy part, but didn't say much about the third leg of that stool, which is food security and food prices. Oh, I didn't. That's true. And um, most, most can you studies, comment on that? Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, this won't enamor me with the governor either, for that matter. But most studies would indicate, if you if you took a average of them again, that a significant fraction of the corn price, those higher prices that I showed you, uh, maybe, uh, let's say, between 10 and 40 percent of it is due to the additional market that was created by the... So uh, it's not the total reason we have high commodity prices, but it is an important reason. And uh, I think that we should find a way not to use food crops if, we're, if we insist on transportation fuels. As a matter of principle, really, that would be... Uh, my take on it. And in addition, there's all these environmental problems that I hope I did el elucidate better. Uh, you know, people claim that the uh, Arab Spring and now more recently Syria has had five years of drought in a row. Maybe you saw this week the article in the New York Times that there's one scholars who think that Syria's war would have never started if it hadn't been for the extreme 
uh, drought. Now you can say that's a, a climate change uh, issue, but it's also a food, it's a food price issue as well. Jerry? Yes. Uh, it seems like the energy density uh, vision is backwards in terms of something. I mean, I assume that's the big cost in the corn stover is even if, uh, forgetting the fact that you aren't leaving the organic matter on the fields, which is not so which good. Which is another issue. Which right? is another issue. Uh, just hauling that stuff anywhere. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to beat 300 million years of just sitting on it under pressure and temperature. There's a lot of issues. If you were to talk to somebody from the Farm Bureau, they would tell you that the new seeds that we're using, they're all genetically modified. Uh, in 2005, there wasn't a single genetically modified crop in Iowa. And now, you know, we're virtually 100%. And it must be OK, because I'm perfectly normal, right? But uh, these crops, we plant, we're planting them twice as dense now, Chip, compared to when you were a kid. And, and uh, it's just uh, the, the number of stocks per has doubled, and yeah, and uh, because of that, there's so much biomass. Many farmers claim they have to get rid of some of it. I, I don't know. Right? Is that economical? Good question. You, you know, you can see what's happening. These production facilities locate, and then they take all the resource from right around them. So it's got to be close. Yes. One other issue that kind of comes to mind, we probably have, uh, in theory, an unlimited supply of Haber nitrogen, but the mineral um, composition, the phosphates, I think, or, or even other minerals, um, and soil itself, can you comment on what the de degradation rate of that is? Future availability? Well, phosphate is the one you're uh, probably especially referring to, and that is in uh, it's high price and reasonable short demand, but um, maybe it'll stimulate some of our colleagues in uh, civil engineering to precipitate phosphate from uh, wastewater treatment plants and other things. So, so far those inputs, I think there's probably enough of those inputs to not create a crisis in the near future, but you raise a good point that there's lots of other inputs in addition to water. Yes, Peter. Sugarcane. It's coming, Peter. I think they're recording. Sh Sugarcane ethanol is about three to five times as, as efficient per unit acre. It depends on what, you, what basis you're talking about. If you're just talking about on an acre basis, they raise about two and a half times more ethanol per, per acre. acre. And, but but how's the water? How does the water usage compare? Uh, it's it's because it, it's way more efficient too. You know, by at least a factor of two or three, uh, for the same reasons because they're getting so much more out of an acre of land. And they're in the semi tropics. But one of the big issues that makes them, you know, a Brazilian ethanol is classified by EPA as an advanced biofuel, so it can fill out this schedule. And my economist friends, they all think that's exactly the way we should do it. The, my economist friends, the, the, they would say that Iowa is the most uh, efficient place in the world to produce corn for animal feed, bar none. Ukraine is maybe close, but by far it's the most efficient place. So if Brazil needs animal feed, they should be buying corn from Iowa. And uh, Brazil is the most efficient place to produce ethanol right now from sugarcane. And so if Iowa wants transportation fuel or the U.S. wants, they should be buying it from Brazil. And there is a certain amount of that. There, it's going on already. Eric Larson probably knows we're actually buying ethanol from Brazil right now. And at times on the spot market, they buy ethanol from us too. We're by far the leading ethanol producer in the nation now. We passed up Brazil, along, or in the world. We passed up Brazil a long time ago. So my economist friends say, you know, you've got comparative advantage in different locations, you should use that, and then you should trade. But that flies in the face of the whole idea of energy security. You know, if, if it's not a friendly world, you can't rely on trading. And that's where Congress was coming from. But I think the economists actually are right. I kind of agree with them. If we want ethanol, we should be buying it from Brazil. They're, they're several times more efficient at producing it than we are. Uh, I mentioned one, one of the reasons is the semi-tropics, they have more calories per 
square meter, but also they're using the uh, rest of the uh, sugar cane to power the plant. And we're using coal and natural gas, as I showed you. So we're turning coal into biotransportation fuels indirectly, and uh, they're, they're doing it much more efficiently. And they are an advanced biofuel. Yes. Jerry, there seems to be a war going on in the media right now about the renewable fuel standard. Could you talk about that maybe? And also the cousin of the renewable fuel standard, the low carbon fuel standard. Those are good questions. Uh, first of all, the low carbon fuel standard comes to us from California, and maybe uh, we have some experience there. There is some opposition to it, but maybe that's more the way uh, we should go. But the, uh, 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 the brouhaha in Washington right now is seemingly coming about because the oil companies, they've made a 10% dent, and it's going to go to 25% uh, just by 2022 in our transportation fuel, and Americans are driving less, and our cars are getting you know, way more efficient. So I think we, we got the notice of the oil companies now, and they're actively fighting the ag uh, senators uh, like uh, from Iowa you know, to try to stop all these subsidies and, and uh, try to stop the whole RFS2 mandate. And they're getting, in addition to the oil states, uh, the ag states are kind of losing influence and in population through time. So I think there might be a, a, a watershed point where they, they prevail and get the whole thing canceled. But that's what's going on in Washington right now. I hate to root for the oil companies. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm curious about, you mentioned that the uh, biodiesel was suffering from a low profit margin, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Is it um, a uh, question of a, energy it's output? It's just or? the nature of the production. You know, the beans are expensive. They're, they're, I didn't show you their prices, but they're high also. And uh, it, it, it's just not as profitable of a process as the ethanol so, it's the, so their margins are smaller. It's so it's the, the process. Most. It's not like a question of comparison to gasoline versus diesel. It's no, like it's diesel just a, I would say just the process makes it an iffier proposition to turn a profit, depending on the feedstock cost, which goes up and down. But they are doing it, and it is growing, like I showed you. Uh, but they are enjoying a very handsome. Uh, tax credit of over a billion dollars a year right now, which is a lot of money. So if there are uh, no more questions, let's thank Dr. 